sort of kept me waiting for a bit to be wet. No. David Horton, ladies and gentlemen, uh, who you may have met him, may have not, who'll be helping me out with questions. He's got more answers than you can look at me. I should prefer to look at him. But he's got a better, better um, more answers. Um, I'm going to avoid starting off with a speech because we don't have long. That's a tragedy of the afternoon. So, um, apart from talking a bit, presumably, about Anagata, no escape. You probably want to hear a bit more about Anagata than I mean, you know all about Liverpool or Lewis or Birkenhead or whatever I came from. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll hand you over to David. So. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that I'm happy to be back. Happy to be back, especially in Sadler's Wells. I haven't seen m much more of London than, than this little corner. I'm glad to have the opportunity to do a, a bit of uh, um, brushing up, I mean sweeping up, I mean brushing up on uh, conversations that I had with ghosts here many years ago. Obviously, I might describe myself as eclectic, others would describe me as a thief. I mean, lots of the ideas I did collect in this very theatre many years ago, originally, uh, uh, performances of the during the golden years of the, the ballet rumbe. Let's go back to the fifties, you see. And uh, later on, Hirsi Man, my first taste of the modern dance, dancers wearing no shoes. And the French ballet, Mirad Biskovich, the first time um, Beja had gone up in the bit since, but the first time. And was, they say that about me. The first time I saw it was. A revelation. And uh, what else? The kabuki. Would you believe? I've got a lot to answer for. Now I'm actually sitting painting my kabuki-ish face in the same mirror that uh, Inuske, who is one of the greatest uh, aligatas, who painted his face in the same mirror. So I've been hoping a bit of that powder that he'd left behind brushed up on me. So it's going to be back to uh, Yes, we're brushing up on uh, all the conversations, as well as useful conversations that I had experienced, either between the actor or the dancer on the stage and me in the stalls, or occasionally in my visits backstage with Nicolas Servich, for example. He was the lighting designer for Alvin Ailey, and he took me around and showed me how it was all done. So to him, I also forever. You don't mind if I smoke, do you? It's not fair to do it without you, but I think you can do it. So, do you want to should we just ask questions? Yes, I suppose. So, yes. We'll talk about it again. I've got my pen just in case. <laughs> <laughs> they always ask me to say, well, I haven't got one, and they've always got a few books. There, was got a scratchy broken. I don't have cigarettes. Yeah. Oh, as far as um, Alagata goes, it is sort of poignant that, that uh, to bring Alagata to some as well as for it. In fact, ever since Gaza had its premiere in October, uh, it was in mothballs for a couple of months. But ever since October, it, it has been working to, to get it ready for Saddle as well, because that's been sort of mental goal. And it's rather poignant to bring it to Saddle as well, which was the, the first place that he, that he saw Kabuki. Um, what was this? You, you saw your first Anagata in the bar? Yeah, we were in the bar together at the same time. That, that destroyed one of, I mean, one of the first ever was Anagatas and Japanese actors. One never thought one they would be so close and had fun in the bar. The bar was being used downstairs as one of those quick change dressing rooms, obviously the Kabuki Theatre itself, which is vast, vast of the buildings that have special rooms. And here they were obliged to do their quick changes in the bar. I was having my, you know, last minute of it, always just after the show started. And uh, he'd brushed past me 
already in his trance. It was the most beautiful thing, and it was one of the most reassuring of my experiences. There was a man who had actually become a woman and was about to enter the stage. He had a little wig and eyelashes, was throwing back you know, the port. Well, that was actually in the trance that I had talked about and I'd read about, read through the pages of Anthony Nacho, etc. But it was the most, uh, most marvelous experience, demonstration of the trance. And he, con he continued to convince me throughout the evening. The joke, but the, nonetheless, the, 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 the first. Japanese theatre had been an obsession uh, long before that. That was when, to the late 50s, early 60s. It was a bit before that, actually. No, I'd been dressing up in kimonos. <laughs> I'd always had my, my own version of the Kabuki long before I saw it, but I was a bit surprised to find that it was so much like, not my own performance, but like my dreams of what the Kabuki might have been like. But from a very early age, since my father, who was a sailor, had brought me my first kimono at the age of two, I was two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the letters began, the, the dialogues between the headmasters of various schools and my mother, dear Mrs. Kemp, don't send Lindsay to school wearing a kimono with all that burn cork around it. <laughs> <laughs> I was born with an obsession for the Orient, for the mythological Japan. And with the kimonos, I also inherited uh, the gestures. I think also that in, that in uh, this, is, this is only my reconstruction of Lindsay's life, so he should know better, but in, in South Shields as a child, in what was a fairly grim, Context really, in terms of terms anyway. To have the, all, the house full of Chinese and Japanese objects that his father had sent back, um, it did represent for him a kind of other world, something you know, a different possibility to to South Shields. This this exotic, much richer, more beautiful reality, and I think that something of that must must have uh, remained always for him in Japan represents a kind of other reality, more more fine, more aesthetic, more intense, more beautiful. Nicer than she is. <laughs> I was fancy Japan would be nicer. It was, you see. And obviously the kimonos that I wore to school gave me more pleasure and, uh, needless to say, more amusement to my classmates and the neighbors than my uh, navy blue overcoat. And when the kimonos were finally taken away from me, I found by uh, reversing the overcoat so it revealed a red lining and then letting it out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was still, uh, yeah, I still had a kimono. I'm still wearing kimonos. And 50 years later, still dressing up and experiencing an incredible pleasure from that kind of garment and the gestures that, uh, that, that, that come with it. I mean, you've got to move that way in a kimono. I mean, you've got to shuffle along, otherwise you break your neck, haven't you? <laughs> I did last night, Mary. I don't know that I just fall up over your three sandals wells. They'll all be waiting for when you trip over. So I'm going to have to be in my kimono. Sue over there, can you see? She's sporting me as a rather nifty little outfit. It's one of mine. It's one of yours. Oh, one of Yeah, to, to, to the costumes for, for our I love, and they do have a life of their own. They don't have to do much choreography, can't they? You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Also, but it's probably interesting to note that <coughs> these oriental objects and kimonos that, that were in the houses as he grew up, were, <coughs> which were presents from his father, but they were presents actually to his sister, as he had uh, a sister who died before he was born. She, who was a kind of extraordinary uh, performer as a child. She went, she went to dancing classes and she had an incredible gift for performing. And she was very much the apple of her mother's eye. Um, she died, she 
was four and a half of meningitis. Um, and Lindsay was, was actually quite consciously conceived as a, as a replacement for this sister. And these kimonos and, and gifts around the house had been gifts from the father to the sister. Um, so that one can, one can speculate on, on uh, the psychological connection. Ah, you a chance, love. <laughs> <laughs> Followed short, shortly after he was, he was brought into the world as a replacement for his sister, and uh, less than two years later, his father drowned at sea. At which point, for his mother, really, he had to play double role, replacing his sister and replacing uh, father, which may explain some of the, the gender complications of his work. And the obsessive imagery, the sailors, they actually came earlier. And always the drowning, the storms and the sea. Even in a midsummer night's dream, you remember, I think you said you remember. I mean, so uh, there was a storm with a drowning sailor. When I went to find the, uh, the magic, the herb, it was my father who gave me the key. Recently, I'd, I'd made it all up. When I, well, I mean, I copied a lot from the Kabuki, but before the Kabuki, what I didn't know, I invented, you see. Uh, but I'd already been giving talks to the Victorian Museum and other museum about the Kabuki. I'd made it up, you see. Made it up, bluffed my way. And, uh, and then I went. And they believed in me. They, they could see the, 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 the Japanese influence in my way. They, my was very popular. And, um, and then I began to study a bit more seriously, too seriously, but I did. I mean, preparing for this show, of course, I did go back and took my shoes off. And I did it. So they showed, they showed me how to use the fan that way, more correctly, etc. The first time was about, uh, oh, it was eight years ago. So funny, oh, I'm glad you asked me. I'm glad I remember that. Yes, we, we went to Japan with a videotape, uh, a videotape of flowers under my arm because I had heard that there was a director there that might be interested and there was the theatre. He took us to see the theatre, which was just kind of rusty iron uh, poles in, in concrete and foundations. And, um, but driving in the country, there, there, was a, the, the, there was the inauguration of a, of a temple. And the priests, the monks, were very pleased to meet, to meet us. And they said, well, you know, we're having a dance later this evening, if you'd like to come. It should be interesting. I've never heard of a Japanese dance before. And uh, we went. And they opened the doors. But there was an audience all sitting, waiting, a bit like this. Time, waiting. And again, they expected, well, how was the dance, you see? <laughs> Unfortunately, I had my cameriest with me, but there was no piano. I could do the Brahms, or you know, I could do Chopin program. I had my makeup just in case. <laughs> but the makeup was a kabuki makeup that I had purchased earlier in the week from a kabuki shop in, uh, in Tokyo. Head and tail of the direction. So I, so I did my best. You know, I mixed a bit of this and a bit of that, and I got it very white and very thick. During the performance, there was no piano in the cabin. What Chopin, Bach, there was in the show. David was obliged to play, and one of those very large drums, indeed. You <laughs> see them being played in this very theatre. The men are obliged to lie on their backs up there and play with it. <laughs> and uh, throughout the evening's performance, the maker fell. <laughs> fell, bit by bit. Ended up like a bit like a burning wall. No, it wasn't there anymore. The stage fell. Yeah, the stage fell, right. Let me touch practice. Yeah, the stage fell, but the stage they had built, I mean, it was temporary stage boards suspended on uh, sake barrels. And it was, yes, it was a bit improvised, and it did. Yeah, that was the first time. And then I went back, and we performed there with the company about six or seven 
And we're going back again for a short bit. And now they've asked me to go with this. <laughs> well, they're very and I need a lot of sake. <laughs> yeah. They're very nervous. The Japanese are is extremely nervous because of the Japanese sensitivity to, to outsiders doing anything Japanese. And we, we kept telling him that it was Japanese contact with him and starting off by that he was very worried to see how Japanese was for him. But of course, they said, oh, no, we don't have a change that. They said that. I mean, they were very sensitive about taking Alice. You know, it was the heads. He said, well, you don't mind taking that bit out. You know, when they, they chopped off the, the heads and then they croaked. I said, yes, of course. He said, why did you say you take the heads out? Well, the Japanese are sensitive. <laughs> about that, anyway, we can take Well, it's nice to be asked to Japan. It was a it was a long time before I took flowers to to France. I mean, for one thing, I was too scared, and it wasn't ready, and it was French, wasn't it? And I wasn't asked because <laughs> 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 the English critics, as usual, said, oh, "That's not good, is it?" But we went, and what did they say? At last, Jenny comes home. It's very nice, isn't it? Glad I took it. But I've waited for 10 years. I've waited for 10 years. I've waited for 10 years these days, haven't I? Oh, dear. Um, I've just read an interview with uh, the Mimbaro's sweat spirit, uh, Jenny, entered his body in the uh, toilet. Do you think anything similar happens to you when you are? <laughs> I feel I have this hand on my shoulder. Yes, I do, I do a bit. I feel I have his, his, his guidance. I think he helps me get, get it right. Yeah, I feel him around me. I don't feel his spirit eventually, but I, I do feel him around me. Um, thank you for the t-shirt, I got it. Did you send me a t-shirt? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was not to be tagged. I just love it to tag when it was sent me a t-shirt. Did you get the t-shirt? What t-shirt? Um, did you have an original vision of your theatre in the beginning? And did it have passes it now to what you originally set out to achieve? So the vision for... What, for no, when you start off, off. I mean, when you were starting with theatre, did you know what kind of theatre you were going to make? I hoped I would make a theatre, a dance for it, you know, that, uh, well, I always, I always danced the way that uh, I liked, and I always hoped at the same time that uh, anyone that was there would, uh, would enjoy. For me, there was no such thing as enjoyment alone, it, it had to be shared. Dance so the theatre is always a gift for the public. So I, uh, yeah, I did the dances that I enjoyed doing, like I'm doing now, and the dances that I, ho I hope you will enjoy uh, sharing. But I didn't uh, decide that it was going to be rather Jeanne-esque at the age of two. Or, you know, <laughs> so. But then it's still very, it's still very much like the kind of theatre that I was enjoying then. I mean, it was song and dance theatre as opposed to a bit of entertainment, illusion, transformation, magic, joy, music, fun. A bit like the Christmas panto, which I love, the transformation, the theatre of transformation, a theatre of dreams, which for me as a child, the theatre that I saw was a theatre of dreams. It was a magical place to be. We've lost, sadly, a lot of that magic from the theatre, colour. It's been replaced slowly, I mean, for the past 300 years, really, actually, with uh, nature. I sound a bit like uh, one of those uh, estrati. <laughs> I mean naturalism. Yes. Literature. Yes. How much are you personally? I mean as opposed to realism. 
like that. But it's real. It's real for me. It's, it's, it's not dreams for me on the stage. It's dreams coming true on the stage for me being inside this being here today. It's not a dream. This is a dream come true with a lot of effort. I mean, I don't dream it. I mean, I don't get the dream, the idea, or the desire, and then, uh, and then make them come true with a bit of help and sort of my own. How much are you personally responsible for the very large effects of all the movement, um, big shapes like the sea? The sea? You keep talking about the sea. Um, and I was just talking about that and I realised that that was not my idea at all. It was, um, Claude, Claude Neville who did the lighting for this, this show. <coughs> it was his idea. I was talking about the storm. I have, as I say, I have to have a storm in everything that I do. But <laughs> <laughs> the sea effect, he says, oh, the sea effect. He said, well, we do this. And he was talking about a bit of certain effect. You know, I didn't think to it. And suddenly there it was, an opening night. But the, but the set, as, as a, a construction of silks, is very much your own. Oh, oh yes, so yes, that was a possible way. It's amazing, isn't Well, I promised my impresario that the next show, this one, trying to wet his appetite, I'm trying to presume to give me another chance. Oh, actually, I tell him, I just pop, 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 and it was a pleasure to make all the ideas up as usual, I'm told right now, as I, as, as I went along. He said, on the set, it's nothing, it's just curtains, just a bit of silk, it won't cost anything. <laughs> But that's why it's, it's that, and I wanted it to be a protean kind of set. I wanted it to be a bit circusy, like all my sets are. That's where I feel the most at home and uh, have tent will travel. It was supposed to be that. And it was also supposed to evoke my early days of putting on my first shows in the backyard at South Shields with uh, yeah, the, the sheets and I did downers for uh, curtains. And a wind machine, of course, that must be hardly by it there. But I, I was just saying that, what would I do if the wind machine broke down? What would Marilyn have done? What do you feel is your relation to Lewis Carroll and Alex? Well, at the moment, there was a time that I was very close indeed last season. But I think after touring with that particular production for two years, I did go up. I felt really trapped in the rectory. <laughs> and I thought, well, if I do another success, which we always hope that what that the next thing is going to be, it's going to be something which is more myself, which is another reason why, I mean, the, the show is made up of many of my souvenirs. I had, yes, I do have a passion for Lewis Carroll, but I, I must say, I haven't thought about him much since I've been uh, in the Orient. I think at the time I made up an awful lot of excuses for doing the, the play, but I, I never really felt comfortable in the dog colour. <laughs> and not being much of a mathematician, it seemed to me, and I had to say so, but it really seemed to be a bit outside. It was only the Cheshire cat, not only because I was born in Cheshire, that you know, felt, but then it was so painful. I mean, physically it was so, but this, I mean, it really hurts. But playing a cat, you know. And I've gone off Carol for a bit. <laughs> when you, in, in the, that performance, the thing that struck me um, what, more than this, this one that, no, no, not Alex. This I saw Alex, yeah. but this one, and then relating perhaps back to something like Midsummer and Night's Dream, and maybe even further back to something that also happened in a cruel garden at Brown Towers. This sort of darkness around, that when you're there as a member of the audience, it's so rarely used. I mean, the young man over there mentioned Chenet. Well, I saw Chenet's The Balcony at, at the Barbican, and was horrified because the whole stage was completely lit, and I thought, well, I never imagined it like that. And um, there was no space for my imagination, my own imagination as a member of the audience. But with your, the pieces of yours that I've seen, I've not I even seen everything you've done, but you seem to have this darkness 
and then small pieces are picked out. And then, of course, somehow in these spaces of darkness, the audience's imagination can get to work, like filling in the areas, rather than having an all-over painting, something that perhaps does relate to you. I mean, does that relate to sort of a notion of the Eastern painting where you have the void or you, you have a sort of area which isn't described? I well, the, whether that was intentional on your part or whether it's just something. Well, the National Theatre have got more money than we have to spend on things like electricity bills. <laughs> <laughs> it killed it killed one's idea. They have. I mean, they've got more. They've got more lights. We can only use, you know. <laughs> so, so many. Anyway, Jenny, for instance, was written to be read by candlelight. It was, it was, it was written that way. <laughs> The darkness that surrounds me, I cannot escape but bring it onto the stage because that's the darkness that, uh, that surrounds all of us, isn't it? And also I'm very, uh, very influenced by the cinema, and, which is why so much of the stage I put into isolation. It, it, it's like, uh, it's like m moving, moving shots, cutaways, jump, jump cuts, cuts. And dissolves. Yes, yes, yes it is. That was the other thing that I yes. was really struck by. I tried to bring to the stage the effect of the close-up of, uh, of the cinema. Clark Gable in close-up. I tried, it's like my face is so distorted. Big, the color is vast. My, my, my mouth is so big. It is like a stretch. I'm trying to make a close-up to me. The light close and made me feel like right in your lap. <laughs> but that's why, yes, they're, they're the, they're the main reasons. Mr. Kemp, how is it for you to play really a woman on stage? Well, it feels easy to tell you the truth on the stage. And I don't know why or how, but it, it flows from I don't practice in front of mirrors, but the, the actor that, that uh, played women's parts never did, certainly not in Japan. It was the other way around. The Anigata would have women come to see, and still, I mean, the women would come to the Anigata to see how women should behave, how, should, how they, they should move, and how they should make themselves more alluring. I, I, it, it seems to come naturally. Stage. But all the characters that you see me do, they do seem to come naturally. It's hard work when I have to come to the world. But the characters say, because they're all part of myself. Obviously, when I play a woman on the stage, it is my feminine aspect taking over the rest of my personality. The gestures are delicate, if women's gestures are delicate, because my, my body is just trained in such a way like a dancer that I can make delicate gestures are Training my technique, but on the stage I become, it seems to me. I don't think about it, oddly enough. Some nights I do. Yeah, I did the other night. Oh, Jesus. I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror, and I did. I was the first to say, I don't feel like we don't try to However, on the stage, and they say, oh, yes, but with a bit of light, a bit more hard on love, you know. I'm all right. Mortified in some of the early videos when I was doing the tango with a black wig, and there was not black. And I looked a bit horsey, I must say. I reminded myself of the transvestite sheriff in uh, Andy Warhol's Lonesome Cowboy. Put around his way about. I take care to shave. And the rest is uh, relatively easy. I don't think performing, that's not easy. Being a demon. Or being a demon, not being a dog. <laughs> do you know yet what you're going to do next? <laughs> well, uh, I'll just say it depends in a minute. And I, I have, I, you know, I mean, I do find it, obviously, that I'm asked to do that. I, 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 I know, I know. 
after tonight, I mean, we've got a few more nights of this, then bright, you know. I've got a lot of ideas that I'm uh, working on. But uh, I have to wait until I get a date, really. You know, I mean, uh, time, a deadline, yeah. I mean, this is that I and mean, I told you, this is, was all done and all already. And I would say, well, you know, you open up the first day. So then, of course, I had to get on with it. Or a similar day for the first day. that. Sleep for four nights. It took maybe it was longer. It was a, a month's rehearsal, which wasn't very long. But you know we don't have any subsidy, and it's expensive. The rehearsal period when no one's paying for tickets. But as someone said before, it did take a lifetime's experience, and all the shuffling I'd done for forty odd years you know, did prepare me for shuffling. I took the as well stage. I'm working on one or two new projects. So I don't know what to talk about. They're not a secret. I mean, I mean, it's just how you talk about them. And then people say, well, whatever happened to the magic book, for instance? <laughs> you know, you talked about the last time, the time before. I, <clears throat> so, I want to do a lot of opera, and I want to do more films, and I want to do, you know, possibly. I'm busy. I'm busy now that we've got Anna Gartra, and you see, I mean, no one's interested in me doing anything else. Thank heavens that I like doing what I'm doing and wearing my favorite. Do you, do you feel more at home with this character or with the part? Oh, no, the, the same, the same, I'm feeling. I don't feel totally at home with me at all. But, yeah, well, part, that, uh, she wrote it for me. Yeah, 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 you wrote it. <laughs> well, my architect, yes, he did. The architect, didn't he? So all the characters that have, have played. Dutchman, the Reverend Charles Dutchman really was the only one I did not feel. I thought it was a bit of a lie that I was still on the stage. I mean, I'm very fond of Narita, you know, no, she's not here today. <laughs> and then the lady that played Alice was, was beautiful. I, just did, I couldn't find the kind of desire for her that, I, that, you know, that I was supposed to have, you know six months a week, you know. <laughs> Since that's I mean, go off the mind. Were you paying any kind of tribute to people like Isadora Duncan and Louis Fuller? Oblique! It's only the eyes that are oblique. No, the, uh, <laughs> no that is a homage. To Isadora. I always wanted to dance Isadora's Duncan, to Isadora Duncan's dances, and Anna Gata enables me to do so. Did Martha Graham talk Would have been a Martha. Yeah, there was just a little bit of Martha, yeah. Well, that's a bit more oblique. I'm more Isadora than I am Martha, even though I always have a great debt to Martha. And since her passing, I feel a lot more strongly influenced. Well, there aren't many of us left now, are there? I always loved Isadora, and she is with me all the time. I read her, and she's won my Bibles, Isadora. I first read my life in Isadora when I was about seven, and uh, it changed it. I mean, from that day to this, I knew where I want, what I wanted to be, and where I wanted to go. How much did you, how, um, how much did you feel rejected by the Valley establishment when they said they didn't think they'd make you before the dancer? I don't imagine I listened. I imagine I wrote it. They wrote to me from the then Sadler's Wells School, saying, you know, after I'd done my first audition, saying, well, we found you both, sorry, but we found you both tight since it was yesterday, we found you both temperamentally and physically unsuited to a career as a dancer, yes. We are sending a copy of this letter to your headmaster and to your mother. Should we still be there for you? Now we listen. That's a sooner more than talking in the next. Well, that's still around. That's why some critics use that way. Do you have they do now to you? Sorry? Do you think that's why some of the critics because I'm physically and temperamentally unsuited. <laughs> 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 because of what they see 
Yeah, because they're going to be fitting in like a rug. I mean, obviously they weren't going to take me, were they? Because I, don't, I, I never did fit in to the kind of... Uh, but I think, I hope they still don't tell kids that. You know, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, you're too fat, aren't you? You know, you can't die, so tell the best. I'm not going to name it. <laughs> yeah. We have time. I would be interested, actually, just hearing you talk about um, after your childhood, you know, just kind of uh, expectation about your life. After my child. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, you, you talk, not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about your child. Like, uh, and mostly he did. I think it's a birthday. But I'd be interested in knowing some more about the time between your childhood and now. And my maturity. Well, I went from Brad. He said, Funny, I'm not reluctant to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was all so miserable. Yes, it was so hungry. My feet were so painful, not from that, but from walking. You know, I was a student uh, in King's Cross with Sigurd Leder, one of the greatest teachers. Sigurd Leder had been a principal dancer of the Ballets Yost, the German Expressions movement of painting. And, and dance, he was my greatest influence. And I was very fortunate to have him as, as a teacher. But it did mean walking from my stories going from rats to riches, <laughs> rubbing, living rough, railway stations. Start. It take too long. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that you had to, if you wish to survive, you had to work in so many completely different situations. Choreographed trip, I'd be working at the home, I'd be working for the ballet company. Yeah. That all went to you know, create a synthesis of style that you can see now. Which wasn't, going back to the very question, wasn't so much sort of a vision that, that set out, but a, but a destiny that, that became revealed at work by absorbing different influences as you went along. Right. <laughs> Just the fact, the fact that it's <laughs> coming back to that reminds me of all that, you know, it's having a really heavy drinker once. And going back to those same drinking places, you know, the squashed tomato sandwiches or something. <laughs> <laughs> stale ale. Um, with your role as a woman on the stage, it was very convincing and, I mean, obviously that's what you do, but the fact that you each different theme that you established on the stage that evening um, was very convincing of someone going through life as a woman. And I was quite sympathetic towards all of that. I mean, is that what you planned on doing? Like the horse scene, I mean, the woman was like seduced by these horses. I mean, the whole time through that, I thought you were being seduced by different things. You weren't so much the demon or anything. You were very vulnerable. And each time you took a layer off, it was like you know, being seduced or, you know. I mean, was that an idea or was that just what you did? You mean going through life as a woman? I mean, off the stage? Yeah, that's. I mean, that would limit the fun, you see, of changing my uh, my roles and my my moods and my my, sh my shape and my clothes. The fairground scene in uh, in in the show comes from my first encounter with sex, as as yeah. it did with uh, Jean Genet and Federica Garcia Lorca and and so on. And was in the room, but I just found the gypsies and the horses. The smell of the hay and the horse shit and the gypsies sweat and the, the oil and all that and the forbiddenness of the fair, the danger of the gypsies' lives, the gypsy moon. It's very sexy though. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but that scene is there really because it does evoke a very important part of my life and, and my uh, and my fascination that I've always had for the for the fairground and the circus and my obsession with the say for Jean Cocteau. When I came up with this show at the last minute, I had been working on a production of uh, about the life and work of, of Jean Cocteau. I didn't finish it, I never got it on because I never found a cocktail. I didn't want anyone to play, to play the role. Obviously, I didn't have the right shape hand in this part. <laughs> and, 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 and so I, I, I didn't, I did, I did this instead, but I, I had the horses. So we put the horses in because I mean, <laughs> cocktail and Jenny is, is so much part of my life, but as is Isadora Duncan, that's why they're there. I described the show. Would you say it was uh, particularly difficult to play for the British public? Or do you feel that it was? Yeah, I feel British, you know. Everybody knows me here. It's a bit easier, you know, when they don't know you. you know, they don't know what to expect. They don't come with preconceived notions. And I haven't heard that you're absolutely awful and that it's an eternal one and a half hours to sit through. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still supposed to tell. I never read the press again. Never. I know that one shouldn't be affected. I knew we'd get around to the British sooner or later. <laughs> one should not allow oneself to be so affected by them that I only just happened to read the standard. I'm not quite yeah. like class, but I know I shouldn't. No, I shouldn't. No, it's like a vodka day. I thought, no, I shouldn't. But I did look how I ended up. But surely the standard critic was, was merely um, what that guy felt about himself rather than about the show that he saw. Yes, I know. I mean, that. what he said is very it. I know. I said that to my. Oh, exactly. Exactly. You mean my imagination, yeah. And now I was telling that to myself when I went on the stage as well, when the time the wires were me, I had to keep my balls out of all. Dear one, he's got problems with himself, and it's so obvious, isn't it? Still, <laughs> there was never an interminable one and a half hours. It didn't make it easy for me to get from stage left to stage right. <laughs> <laughs> and the show's got to last an hour and a half anyway, hasn't it? And it's a pity that it did go, just went through my head. I mean, after a while, I and then the applause and the numbers I really like. I mean, I don't. The, uh, the critics are so, um, and, uh, and yeah, and representative of you. I mean, or of the public, or even the British counterpart. I like to think that all the critics are nasty. Yeah, they are. Well, not all the critics, anyway. I didn't even read the Times or the Independent yesterday. I'm missing the independent. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd read that before the performance. It's silly, isn't it? And I'm toughish. I feel for little ballet dancers, you know, girls that are making the first appearance on the stage of Covent Garden, you know, or actresses, isn't there the daughter of uh, somebody in state in Hollywood? I mean, I should go with Jessica. Just say, you know, she should never be an emotionary, no talent, too fat, you know. Right. It must really destroy. They just they destruct it. There was a time when we had great critics, remembering Richard Buckle and, and Peter Williams, the dance critics, Harold Hobson, of course. We've still got some good ones. I read those. <laughs> <laughs> but they were creative, weren't they? They were like creative people. They did things on their own besides you know, bitch other people. Yeah. <laughs> Books. Did things. Can I ask you a question? Can I? Can I see one of your performances? Um, I might be wrong, but I always feel like I'm transported into a more 19th century kind of theatre because of the spectacle, um, which we don't normally see on the stage. So do you, do you ever feel it altered at the time of the century? Or? Awful. Yes, I do. I really don't much care for the 20th century at all. I have some good times in it. And I'm glad to be here, but I think it's better than the last century. I love the theatre of the last century because, like I was saying, I love the theatre of magic and transformation. 
I like to use the machinery and the trapdoors. They don't have trapdoors in the theater anymore, you know. It's all, they've all been screwed up. You can't kind of do this marvelous thing. Leeds, you can. Leeds haven't been asked for Leeds for years. How much was the piece, I don't like to use the word ambition, because of like, the critics bit about how people in this country are often very critical if you appear to um, use instances of your personal, obviously, instances which relate to your sort of personal feeling. But how much was that piece to do with the ambition of a person in the theatre or a dancer to be centre stage. Because it was pretty amazing. Oh, I wanted to do that. I really wanted to prove to myself I wanted to do it before it was too late. I could have easily not have done it and you know and, and, and just uh, you know taken the, the, the jobs that hurt less, maybe you know, directing jobs and acting jobs and things. But I wanted, you know, before it was too late to kind of show you what I can do. And that's why I really worked very hard and then I brought this show because, and not one of the others, because I, I, I had hoped. Well, it is. It, I'm not saying it's a great show by any means, but it's the best. But, um, and yeah, it is. It'd be better than I, I mean, it is an attempt. And, and I, I wanted, I wanted to see my name up there. And I can see Marcel Marcel dreams. It's not, it's a bit of ego, isn't it? Obviously, you never want to be a star. And I did. I had a dream that I would be. Because you're going to have to hurry up. You know, you haven't gone long. You know, you know. It doesn't say Lindsay Kemp, you know, my face like it in Marcel Marcel. It does. It's got Lindsay Kemp Company. It is the Lindsay Kemp Company. <laughs> no, I love working with the company, but to be absolutely truthful, yes, I did. I wanted to be up there on my, I wanted to prove to myself that I could hold an audience on, on my own. Almost everybody else, but I wanted to. I wanted to be recognized as a performer, and I'm often not. I mean, the critics, or people, they do give it a rave review, you know, Yes, the costumes are lovely, it's very nice, and the costumes are very nice. But it doesn't often talk about my own performance. So I, uh, I want to be a memorable, useful performer. Yeah, I want to be so Would you like <laughs> something to be <laughs> I want to be famous. Would you like <laughs> any particular like favorites of your own of your shows? Or are they the favorites that you are performing at the time? Not usually at the time, no. I love doing it with the flowers. Yes, and the jinx. And the jinx. Uh, it's sad that we haven't done it once. You haven't done missed, that so. in years. Yeah, and there's, there's anything anyone missed in anything else. Well, it was an anagata. I mean, but... <laughs> <laughs> Is there any? And the jinx I loved, and I regret, and I, I am, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to do. But it's, I can't say so, I'm sorry. I can't say it's one of my favourite shows because it's so um, painful to perform. And they talk about my self-indulgence. You know, I'm not a masochist. I'm not. It hurts too much to perform that play for very long, and so did Salome come to that. I'd really like to find a play where I make everyone laugh. Maybe that's what I should have said. I'm waiting for my bit. <laughs> Is there a chance that we might see you in Salome again? Yes. <laughs> yes, there is. I really don't know when, but uh, I'd like to do that again as well. Dad played the part. Someone said I said I play Herod because I could. But I did like to play Salome. It's a bit cheap, but it's okay. I should have one leg. Okay. We should be doing with one leg. I can do it with scarcely two. I would like, maybe with another salad there. I have a few ideas, but I would like. Yeah. It's a bit decadent, isn't it? 
do people feel when they come away from something? You saw it, you know David Plato. Yeah, how can I? He's not actually on the stage in this physically, but I have his head. <laughs> his head. So, less painful than when I have my head in drills. <laughs> right. So it's David performance stage. Because I remember David at the Roundhouse. In Salome. In Salome, yes. Do you perform it? I'm not in this. I do I sort of occasionally get called upon to emergencies. But it's not only an emergency. <laughs> well, I occasionally say yes. I was nearly on for a horse the other day. Yeah, he did. It's all ready to have that. It's in my makeup. Don't give me any makeup. No, this time I cheated. I just had my mask on the stage. a lot, a lot of Spanish music, and I couldn't find the right kind of music. And Douglas McNichol, one of the boys, brought me that, uh, that a tape with a lot of Spanish music about this particular scene. I thought, sit and look at the music, and we rehearsed it. And then someone then said, this is beautiful, the Lord's Prayer. And it is, in fact, a flamenco version of the Lord's Prayer, which is perfect for that uh, particular scene. There are other scenes like uh, the beginning, the St. Matthew Passion, from the very beginning. Both ideas came at the same time. The storm, the St. Matthew Passion, and flying around. That came at the same time. And the end, the, the, the Strauss. I knew I was going to fly up at the end. I mean, I was going to fly in at the beginning and fly to the end. The middle bit, I wasn't so sure. That came at the same time. I always have the beginning and the end. You've got to have that in the start, especially at the end. Mark is that. You start with the end and then from the beginning. And, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, and then I uh, <coughs> heard the Strauss on the radio. And you know, it didn't seem familiar. It just seemed I knew it was Richard Strauss, but I, I, I wasn't very familiar with, with the song. And, uh, and I, I just tried to sing the song, you know, in the local music shop. Wow! <laughs> 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 you know, you know. And, and then looking through my straps for something else, it, it was on the back, wasn't it? I was on the back of the, you know, very scratched Salome dance, which is that you know, used for these dance classes and stuff. And I'd never, never played it. Are you sure about that? <coughs> Virgil wrote it, he had written all the, the original music, had written some music for the end, which he was very fond of. And it was very nice, but well, it wasn't Strauss, and this original Strauss is so perfect. It helps me, I use great music when I can, because, well, it helps get me there, isn't it? Going to heaven, when music is so important to me. It is the most direct route to heaven. And the ideas, they came from all over the place. Some were mine, most of somebody else's. But I put them together, and David kept me working. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. I was taught at a very early age that it's not good manners to talk about yourself. 
chosen Rome to live, of all places. Why, why Rome? Of all places, because it is the most beautiful city in the world, and I'm happy living there. It's a free place to live. They like me there. I'm and the things taste better, <coughs> and they look better, and I'm afraid to go down the street. You, know, you seem to have got more credit. More spending money. Success, so <laughs> much. Oh, more yeah. Than here, really. Were you living in Barcelona one time? Yes, I lived in Barcelona for about five years, and that was also very useful. But I didn't fall out of love with Spain. I just fell in love with, with Rome anyway. I first lived in Rome after many years, six years ago, and I decided then that one day I'd, I'd have a house in Rome. I was dreaming again. But uh, thanks to Japan, a few gigs over there, and. Uh, it's a poem. It's living in a romantic poem. And having Keats and Shelley just around the corner. It's very nice. Very nice. It is somewhat lovely. I'm happy to be back here. Do you live near the Spanish Steps, then? Not far. Oh, okay. <laughs> I live around the corner from the Colosseum. Anyway, another reason for living there, I mean, amongst all those ruins, is that makes me feel quite young. <laughs> 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 um, I know you all want me to give a better performance tonight. So, get 
Brandon for that. So, and, and you know, if they did that, anything else, we didn't have around afterwards, you know, you know, as well. There are no more questions on that. So, a big thank you to Lindsay and to David. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you.